hired the USPTO as a patent examiner in the receptacle closure area and later joined the International Patent Legal Administration as a special program examiner, or SPRE. Currently, Ms. Hilton is serving as an assistant outreach coordinator for the Eastern Regional Outreach Office at the USPTO. Please take it away. Well, I'm so much to learn here this morning, so much value. Thanks for joining us. Good morning, and thank you so much for that introduction. Welcome to all of you. I hope that today will be uh, time well spent for you. I'm going to give you as much information as I can about how to draft a patent. What I will do throughout the presentation is I will stop periodically to see if there are any questions. Um, as was mentioned before, my colleague Albert is in the um, chat, monitoring the chat for us. And at the very end of the presentation, I will again answer questions. But most importantly, I will show you what a patent looks like in case you've never seen one. We're going to talk about the, the parts of the patent. But I think once you see it, it might make a little bit more sense to you. At least it would for me. I'm a visual learner. I like to see things. So if you tell me something and then you show it to me, then ah, I, I can make the connection and it makes it a lot better for me. So I hope to do the same thing for you. Of course, the very first thing I have to tell you is this is for informational purposes only and it's not considered to be legal advice. If you need legal advice, please consult um, someone of authority that can help you with that, a patent attorney or agent. And of course, you can always use the SBDC for guidance and any other matters that you might need. Okay. Keep in mind that I cannot see you. Um, so make sure that you're paying attention to the, um, to the screen. Again, I will start period stop periodically to see if there are any questions because I think that you might have a few but hopefully I'll make it clear enough that you won't have any questions, but I'm more than happy to answer them if you do. So today, what are we gonna talk about? Again, we're gonna talk about the parts of a patent application. By the end of this presentation, I would hope that you would know what the contents of a patent application disclosure are. They are the detailed description, the drawings, abstract, and the claims. We will briefly talk about the enablement requirement as well as what the limitations are um, that can be modified in your claims once you have filed your application. And most importantly, the importance of clear and consistent language throughout the disclosure. Today, we're gonna to talk primarily about utility applications. There are other applications, design applications and plant patent applications, but we're only gonna talk about utility today. So a provisional application is not examined and it's not published. And there's a one year time limit on that. And it's only for utility applications. Now a non-provisional application can claim priority back to that provisional application. The non-provisional is examined by an examiner. It must include claims and a written description must meet the requirements for a complete patent application. It is published at 18 months from the earliest priority date unless there's a request for non-publication at the time of filing. And of course, the non-provisional can become a patent. So let's start talking about the parts of a patent application. Most importantly is the title. So what is the title? It should be short and specific in describing the, the invention. So let's think about this in terms of what would be a quick description for someone to understand what your invention is. You might want to avoid language such as system and method for, but it should allow the reader to readily ascertain what your invention is. As was mentioned, I was an examiner in the container closure area. And sometimes I would get applications where the title was a closure. Well, that could have been anything. So Anyone looking at that couldn't really tell what kind of closure, what was the invention of that. All they knew it was a closure or a cap. So you want to be a little bit more specific. You want to keep it short, maybe less than 10 words, but make it such that anyone looking at your application will know what the, it is based on the title. The specification is the written description of the invention. It should be clear full and concise with exact terms to allow any person skilled in the art um, to make or use your invention. And it should actually describe how to make or use your invention without un undue experimentation. 
it should have at least one specific embodiment and it does include the claims. There must be at least one claim in, the, in a non-provisional application and that claim will begin on a new page. And we'll go through the parts of this a little bit more detail later. The specification has a sp specific format that we're looking for. Um, it, again, it should include the abstract and the claims. Um, the line should be double spaced or at least 1.5. You wanna write on only one side of the paper in portrait orientation, eight and a half by 11 inches with the margins um, of three quarters of an inch, except on the left side, which is one inch. And that was because that was for binding the applications together. The application must be numer numerically sequentially numbered. Um, you either want to center that at the top or the bottom of the page and you must use non-script font, preferably in 12 point font size. There are certain sections of the specification that are important. Again, we have the title, short and specific. There are common parts of the application and then there are other parts that are less common and we'll talk about those in detail as well. So the most common parts of the application would be the background, which is the state of the art before your invention, a brief summary of the invention, a brief description of the drawings, which will list all the figures by number, um, a detailed description of the invention, your claims, which will start on a separate sheet, and your abstract, which is also on a separate sheet, is less than 150 words, and it is in one paragraph. And you want to not use words that are saying things such as a means for. You want to be very specific uh, so that someone can easily ascertain what your invention is by reading both the title and the abstract of the application. The lesser used sections would be a cross-reference to related applications. For instance, if you're claiming priority to a provisional application or if your application is a continuation or a divisional of another application, you need to include that in the first sentence of the specification. If there is some federally sponsored research that your invention is a part of, you need to have that in the application as well. If there are parties to a joint research agreement, those should be listed. If there's a, if you're incorporating by reference any material submitted via compact disk or a text file, that's typically if we're dealing with sequence listings, that should be in the application. Um, and then if there's a statement regarding a prior disclosure by either you as the inventor or a joint inventor, please include that in the specification as well. So let's talk about the background of the invention. We're going to go into a little deeper dive into all of the parts of the um, specification. So in the background, you want to have the field of invention described at a high level. This would be what is the state of the art? What is the state of the inventive concept that you have before your invention itself. You want to describe the related prior art. Hopefully you will do a search on your own so that you'll know what the state of the art is. That will help you to potentially get your application processed towards a patent sooner if you would have the related art, if you know what that is. So describe that if you know what it's done, what it is. Describe any problems that lead you to come up with your invention. And again, describe what the prior art is that you know about. You wanna have a brief summary of the invention. Describe it at a high level. Describe the problems that you solve using your invention. You want to um, make sure that your invention is special and different. What is that? Tell us what that is in this specification. You also wanna tell us what the invention does, if it is a Mechanical device, what does it do? If it's a means for using it, how would you use that device? Or how would you make the device? Now let's talk about the drawings a little bit. Drawings are not required, but if it makes it easier to understand the invention, then you should have drawings in your application. They should be submitted at the time of filing your initial paperwork. Um, because otherwise it's not released from initial processing. So if, it, if drawings are required, make sure they're part of the specification at the time you file your patent application. Again, you must have a brief description of what these 
figures are. Um, and we'll have a little more detail about that in a few, a few moments. I'll show you what those are. Again, I'll show you what a patent app, what a, a published patent looks like so that you can see what these look like as well. It'll make it a little more clear for you. As I said before, the drawings are part of the disclosure and the invention required if it's necessary to understand the invention. And the drawings are necessary to, um, and should be introduced at the time of filing of your application. It must show every feature of the invention that is claimed. And you should have as many views as necessary to show the invention. According to 37 CFR 1.84, there are two acceptable standards for drawings. There are black and white drawings are normally required for utility and design applications and color drawings are permitted, can be permitted in design applications, but they are definitely published with the plant patent applications. As was previously noted, these drawings are in black and white. The lines and numbers should be heavy enough to permit, permit adequate reproduction. You use reference characters. They will be in the specification and in the drawings. You want to show those and have reference. So if someone looks at the drawings and they see item number one, they can find item number one in your specification as well. Each figure should be labeled. For instance, figure one, uh, so however many you might have, even if you only have one figure, you still have to have it labeled as a figure. And you want to avoid descriptive words in your figures. So basically you just want to have a picture, not a photograph picture, but just a drawing, a scaled drawing of your um, invention in each figure. As I mentioned before, you must have an abstract. It should start on a separate page with the heading abstract. Must be 150 words or less, and it should be 1.5 or double spaced. And the reason we say 150 words or less is because it's printed on the cover of the published patent itself. And if it's too long, then it, you get into a little bit of trouble. You can't get fit everything on there because you have certain parts of the application that is published as a patent that's on the front page. So therefore the abstract has to be short enough so that everything will fit um, neatly on the page. It should be a narrative form in a single paragraph. So you can have multiple sentences, but it's just one single paragraph, 150 words or less. It must point out what is new in the technology. It should not be a repeat of the claims or the brief, des brief description, a brief summary. And it must be written such that the public can quickly determine the nature and the technical disclosures of the invention. And you can refer to the MPEP, stands for Manual of Patent Examining uh, Procedures in section 608.01b for more information. So let's talk a little bit more about the detailed description of the invention. It is a very important part of the application um, and therefore it should be full, clear, concise, and use exact terms when explaining the invention, the process of making and or using the invention to allow any person skilled in the art to make or use it. You should use exact terms to describe your invention. You want to make sure that your detailed descriptions are focused on explaining the structures, the processes or methods or compositions of the invention. You also want to make sure that you refer to the figures at any time if, a, if necessary. You should avoid, I'm sorry, you should explain the different parts of the invention by using the reference numerals that are shown in the figures. You want to be extremely careful on what you write in your detailed description because it's the basis to, supply, to provide support for the claims. Everything that's in the claims must be in the description and we call that antecedent basis. So in order to have antecedent basis for anything in the claims, you make, must make sure that you have that information in the specification in the detailed description. We'll talk about writing uh, how to write your claims a little bit later. Um, but for now, just make sure that you have the terminology, again, that is in the claims, must be in the specification. You want to be consistent. Uh, you want to use the same terms that are in the specification for your claims. Um, what you might want to do is to consider writing your claims first, 
so that then you can determine what you need to put in your specification. This is just a suggestion, but it's not necessary. If you write your specification first, make sure that the claims have the language that's in the specification. So however you do it, just make sure that you have proper antecedent basis for the claim language. And you can always use a checklist to make sure that the detailed description provides a clear support for any claim language. Let's talk a little bit about specification dues, and then we'll talk a little bit about uh, spe about the don'ts, but we'll call that maybe cautions. So let's talk about the do's first. Again, you wanna make sure that you use language that is clear and concise and use exact terms so that anyone can make or use your invention without undue experimentation. When referencing the drawings, you wanna be sure that each reference numeral is used for only one part shown in the drawings and that each reference numeral is shown in the drawing is actually mentioned in the specification. There were times as an examiner where I would find a, a number in the drawings, but I wouldn't find them in the specification. So then I had to point that out to the, to the applicant. So make sure that any numbers that are in the specification are in the drawings and vice versa. You wanna provide at least one specific embodiment, including what is best known or the best mode of operation for you at the time of filing. You want to be sure that your brief description of the drawings um, are clearly labeled and that each figure has its own label. So for instance, if you have figure one and it has subparts to it, you have to say figure 1A, figure 1B, figure 1C, okay? And collectively they're figure one, but the each, each part of that figure must be labeled separately as figure A or figure uh, 1B, okay? Again, you want to make sure you have proper antecedent basis for all terms in your claims. So again, go back to your specification and make sure you have that. So for instance, if you call something a bike in the spec, make sure it's a bike in your claims as well. And you want to make sure that you focus on the technical features of the invention in your claims. So here's some cautions or some don'ts. Please do not use trademarks in the title or to describe any structure. For instance, you cannot use the term Velcro because it is a trademarked name. You must use hook and loop fastener instead. Also, do not use a mark such as a logo or brand name that you intend to register for commercialized product. Um, you don't want to put that in your claims. In the background of the invention, um, you don't need to state how you came up with the invention. For instance, you don't need to say, oh, while I was jogging, I came up with this idea. That is not necessary. You want to avoid hyperbolic language in your claims, uh, in your specification, because you don't know what's gonna happen with your patent or with your invention. So you don't wanna say things like this invention will sell or make millions or this invention will revolutionize the field because you don't know what's gonna happen. So you wanna avoid that hyperbolic uh, language. Do not include a detailed discussion. The figures refer um, to reference characters in the brief description in that section, okay? And this is written as a don't, but I wanna turn this around as a precaution and make it more positive. Please, please, please proofread your specification to look for gr grammatical errors. Um, there's no reason to have to get an office action saying and pointing out grammatical errors to you because you want to make sure that you get your application process more, the quicker it will be towards um, a patent grant and just having grammatical errors in there will slow that process down. So please make sure that you review your application for any grammatical errors, not just in the specification, but also in your claims and the abstract and the entire specification, okay? Are there any questions so far? Okay, I don't hear anything, so I'm gonna say we're gonna keep moving on. There was one, but I believe Albert answered it already, so. Okay, great, super, thank you, thank you, Albert. So let's talk a little bit about the claims, okay? Again, it's very, very important because the claims actually 
define the meets and bounds of your invention of what is protected legally, okay? What is legally enforceable is what's found in the claim language, not in the entire specification, although the specification provides the antecedent basis for the claims. It's the claims is what is used to determine the legal enforceability of your patent. Again, it must conform to the invention as set forth in the remainder of the specification and any terms and phrases used in the claims must find clear support or antecedent basis in the description so that the meaning of the terms in the claims are clearly understood by reference to the description. Okay. I can't state that enough. <clears throat> Again, your claims must start on a separate sheet from the rest of the specification and it should have claim listing at the top and the heading 1.5 or double spaced. Each claim is a single sentence that begins with a capital letter and ends with a period. Um, so that means that any punctuation that's necessary to um, segregate parts of the invention can be used, but you want to have your claim as a single sentence. There are additional fees that are imposed if you have more than three independent claims or an excess of 20 total claims. And that information can be found on the USPTO.gov website, what those fees are. You want to number your claims consecutively in ascending order, and you must preserve the original numering of your claims throughout the press, uh, prosecution of the application. So let's say you get an office action and several of the claims you decide you want to cancel, meaning you want to get rid of those claims. So let's say you have claims one, two, and three, and you want to cancel claims one, two, and three and put additional claims in there. Well, you can't just renumber the new claims as one, two, and three. You have to then go to claims four, five, and six. You can use the language that was in claims one, two, and three and add additional information into those claims. But again, the numbering has to be consistent. So you since claims one through three were already canceled, you must start with claims four, five, and six in your numbering in order to preserve the original um, claim numbering in your application. The US patent law has certain requirements as you might imagine. So it says that a non-provisional patent application must have at least one claim particularly pointing out and distinctly claiming the invention. The claim must be written in independent form or it could be written in dependent forms if you have more than one claim. A dependent claim necessarily incorporates all the references of the limitations of the claim from which it depends. Um, so that means that uh, if you have a claim that says I claim a container comprising a, a opening of a a container wall and a bottom. And then when you get to claim number two, you would say claim number, the container of claim number one, further comprising um, details such and such on the sidewall. So it's automatically going to incorporate the limitations that were in the a previous claim from which it depends or which it refers back to. So how do you plan to write your claim that best reflects your invention? Let's think about this a little bit. You don't want your claims to be too specific. You don't want them to be too general. You want them to be somewhere in the middle. So let's talk about that a little bit and how to think about that. When your claim is too specific, it might not provide much value to you because someone could easily work around your claim and, and find something to then be able to use your invention without giving you credit. But on the other hand, if the claim is too general, then it might not be patentable because that might be known in the art. Okay, so you want to make sure it's just, just right in the middle. So consider drafting a claim that's exactly what you've invented. Of course, that first claim might be a little too narrow, too specific, but just write it out anyway. For example, 
if you invent a flying car, you would probably put all the details of what is used to build that car or to make the car, all right? But then when you reach your claim, you can then determine what the common elements are that can be exchanged for other components. You can also decide what common, common components are not necessary in that claim. Although they must be enumerated in your claims, your independent claim could be a little more general, and then you can add more details into the dependent claims so that you can have specific coverage for your invention. Okay. Let's take a look at a claim here. Now, this one we think is a little too broad. You have a claim for a vehicle comprising a frame, a first and second front wheel, a first and second wheel aligned in space behind the first and second front wheel, a seat connected to the frame, a removable top portion made of cloth, wherein each wheel rotates and is connected to the frame. This is applicant's invention, and this is what applicant is claiming in the independent claim. Now, if you can imagine, this could be almost any kind of car or vehicle. For instance, it could be a covered wagon. You might say that's a stretch, but let's, let's take a look at it. We have a frame. We have first and second wheel, front wheels. First and second, we have to assume this on the other side because we can't see it. First and second um, rear wheels aligned and spaced behind the first and second front wheels. We have a seat connected to the frame, a removable top portion made of cloth, wherein each wheel rotates and is connected to the frame. So in this case, we can see that this claim is just a little too broad. Now let's see what happens if we add more detail to cover this invention. Here we have a vehicle comprising a motor, so it definitely takes the covered wagon out of play. A yellow frame, including a plurality of hinged doors. You still have the first and second wheels and the first and second wheels in the rear behind the first ones. A seat connected to the frame. Now we've added a plurality of glass windows connected to the frame. Two red lights connected to the frame, two metal bumpers connected to the frame. Um, we still have that removable cloth top. And now we have that each wheel is made of rubber. Well, this is very specific. And it might be a little too specific. For instance, you have this yellow car. Is the yellow frame necessary for this? Probably not. So let's, th let's think about that. Do we really need the yellow? I'm gonna say we don't. It might be important to this, to the inventor to say it's yellow, but that is not the patentable feature. That could be some other um, intellectual property that we are not covering today. So in this case, I believe that this claim is a little bit too specific for applicant to claim in the initial claim one. Perhaps you could put yellow frame down in a dependent claim. So again, think about your invention. And before you start drafting your claims, you want to consider several questions. What is the invention? What are the parts that are important that make up the invention? How do the pieces and the parts relate to one another? Do you have to claim more than one invention? Okay, think about that. If you have an apparatus, machine, or composition, do you also have a method of making or using it? That might be something to consider that you want to put in your, uh, app, in your specification and in your claims as well. And are there multiple versions of each invention? Remember I said before, you have to have at least one embodiment but you might have several embodiments in your invention. So think about that and how you write your claims. Again, you wanna have a, an independent claim 
that is broad enough to cover your invention, specific enough to cover your invention without being either too broad or too specific, because you can always add more specificity in the dependent claims. You need to think strategically about your patent application. Uh, what are the goals you want to accomplish? Do you want to obtain the broadest valid claims? I think that might be important. Uh, do you want to obtain claims with a variety and type of scope in one filing? <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, your goals could change, so strategy may also change. Maybe the time of filing you have different goals, but during prosecution after seeing prior art from the office action of the examiner, you might want to adjust your goal, expectation or strategies, because what you might claim might not be patentable based on the prior art that's presented to you. Which means you might have to adjust your fence and move it to make it a little more narrow. All right. It is possible that some claims you file might be amended during prosecution. So you might have to be concerned about 35 USC 154D for your provisional rights because the federal circuit has interpreted that this provisional right, or some call it a pre-issuances damage statute, actual notice of the published patent application is a necessary element of infringement, even when the infringer buries his head in the sand to avoid knowledge of the application. So it's about speed versus possible equality patent claims. The sooner your patent is granted and published, the sooner the date you can obtain this provisional right from the date of publication, which is an actual notice. So you have to be very strategic um, about your filing of your patent application, as well as make sure that it is a completed application, enumerating all the things that we talked about before. I talked a little bit before about um, the money, the cost of claims. You have to think about how much money you want to spend on your claims. Independent claims in excess of three is an additional $120 per claim, subject to change, of course. Excess claims in, in addition, excess claims of 20 total claims is an additional $25 per claim. And this is not just at the time of filing, but during prosecution. So if your claims go over excess of three independent or excess of 20 total, anytime during prosecution, you will receive a bill indicating that you owe fees for those claims. Of course, um, the USPTO does provide uh, discounts for not only micro entity, but small entity um, applicants as well. And you can find more information on that in, uh, on our website. But please keep in mind that a micro entity, you must provide a form that that allows you to claim a micro entity status. And those are SB 15A and 15B, depending on whether it's a university or it is a individual for um, gross income. One other thing that we'd like to talk about with uh, drafting your claims is for utility application, there are three main parts. There's the preamble or the introduction. There's the transitional phrase, such as comprising, which is an open term, consisting of, which is a closed term, and then the body reciting the elements of the invention. The transitional phrases in the patent claims, again, comprising versus consisting of. When you have comprising or which comprises, it is an open term and it's most commonly used in patent claims. The claim encompasses all of the listed elements and may include more. So for instance, if you say a method of making a car comprises attaching a joystick to the frame and attaching a wheel to the frame, you can then add more details in a dependent claim. So in claim two, you could say um, the car of claim one, the method, I'm sorry, the method of claim one further comprises attaching an engine to the frame. So we have comprising, which is an open term. You can then add more detail in the dependent claim. Conversely, if you use consisting of, it's a closed term and you cannot add further limitations to it. So whatever is in claim one, you cannot add further limitations um, based on using consisting of. 
So for instance, um, going back to the previous one, if you have a car consisting of a frame and a wheel in claim one, then in claim two, you cannot say that the car further comprises an engine because you use consisting of, which is the closed frame. Just as we talked about do's and don'ts of the specification, let's talk about the do's and don'ts or the cautions of a drafting your claims. So you want to particularly point out and distinctly claim the subject matter regarded as your invention. So make sure when you write your claims, you're, you're thinking about that. What is my invention? What is specifically I need to put in there? Consider drafting your claims first and then your specification based on the claim, claim term language. You want to review both the claims and the specification to make necessary additions and corrections so that the claims find support in the specification. You then want to ensure that each term has proper antecedent basis. You want to think about the legal protection you need for your invention and to tailor your claim accordingly. I want to repeat this again because I think it's very important. Throughout the process, you want to refine your claims and your specifications. If you amend your claims after receiving your office action, make sure that you have the claim language that's in the specification because you want to make sure you still have proper antecedent basis throughout prosecution of the claims and your specifications. You want to make sure you have that proper antecedent basis. So please make sure you do that throughout prosecution. One of the cautions I'd like to remind you of is to make sure that you use um, proper statutory classes, right? So you don't, you don't want to have a claim that has a widget and a method for using in the same claim, okay? You have to have two separate claims for that. So it has to be a widget comprising and a method for using a widget, two separate claims. You want to make sure that you use the same consistent language for things in the specification. So for instance, if you have a visor, advisor member, advisor section, a removable visor portion, if those are all the same things, then use one term consistently throughout the specification and the claims. You don't want to be confusing um, the reader by using a visor or a visor member. Make sure you use a consistent language and just pick one of those to use it throughout. No multiple sentence claims. Again, a claim must be of one sentence only. You do not want to refer back to only a portion of the claims in a dependent claim. So for instance, you don't want to say uh, the widget of the apparatus of claim one. Instead, it should be the apparatus of claim one, wherein the widget, the widget is made of, let's say, copper. You do not replace elements from another deep another claim within a dependent claim. Okay. We have a number of resources available to you, and we will be sending slides out to you once we complete the um, presentation, probably tomorrow. Um, here's a list of resources available to you th through the USPTO. <clears throat> Excuse me. We have our utility patent application guides, uh, the process of patent uh, search tools. We have Trademark Assistance Center and help videos. We do have uh, IP awareness assessment tool, inventor and entrepreneur resources. We actually have a pro se assistance center as well that can help you. Um, information about the micro entity status, uh, pro bono help and videos. Uh, we also have a law clinic program. You can find all this information at uspto.gov that will help you. We do have the Office of Innovation and Development there's virtual assistance by appointment for pro se applicants. Um, there's a hotline in the um, email address. We do have our PTRCs, which are our um, patent and trademark resource centers. They're partnerships for education and they can help you to begin your search as well to help you with the search tool that we have online. We do have inventor outreach. Um, so you can find independent inventor gr groups and conferences. As a matter of fact, 
the Office of Innovation and Development will be having Invention Con. This year is August 10th through 12th. It will be virtual again. Um, it is a wonderful place to meet other inventors, entrepreneurs, and makers. Um, they will have speakers to come in to talk about various things that might be helpful to you. So if you can uh, attend, please go onto our website and register to attend Invention Con. Um, that is the end of the presentation. Uh, are there any other questions? Robin, the one that I see, a yes. most recent question is, is there a comprehensive list of benefits for patenting our IPs? Also, I had heard that we can prevent products that infringe our patents from entering the US market. Do we send something to the Customs and Border Protection? Answer to the last question is yes. To send it to patent uh, Border Protection. So yes, if you have a patent or trademark and you want to register that so they'll know and they will prevent um, knockoffs from coming into the country. So yes, that is true. And part um, one of that question was, is there a comprehensive list of benefits for patenting our IPs? Uh, I'm not right, quite sure what you're looking for. So I'm gonna say, no, there is no comprehensive list of benefits. The benefits basically to you are to pertain, you know, for, to keep other people from making, using or selling your invention. That's, that's usually what we say is the comprehensive list. If you're looking for something more detailed than that, I don't have anything to offer to you unfortunately. What I would like to do is to share. Um, can you see this yes. uh, patent? Okay. So just so that you know what a, a, the front of a patent will look like. And we, it's, it's like I said, it's just easier for me. If you tell me something, I can kind of get it. But if I see it, it just makes it easier for me. So I'd just like to share this so that people can see what we were talking about. So this is what a patent would look like. Of course, here's the um, this is list the inventor. Okay, so we only put like the first named inventor and then at Al if there's more than one. Talks about the assignee. Here's the date of the patent that was granted as well as the patent number. Um, so there's a lot of other information that I won't necessarily go over, but here is the, the filing date, um, the, cla the classification you'll see here. You'll see a list of the documents that were, were cited for the application. Here's the title, Closure Having a Drip Minimizing dip, a Lid. Hopefully that gives you an idea of, the, of what this is. If I just said, this just said a closure, you wouldn't really know what kind of closure it is. What is the, the inventive feature of this closure? But when you say drip minimizing lid, that gives you a little more detail of what we're talking about, All right? So here's the abstract. Okay, we see that we have six claims and six drawing figure, figures. And so we picked the one that seems to be most comprehensive for showing the invention. So this is what the closure looks like. <clears throat> okay. So this is one feature. This is the closed closure, of course, figure one. Figure two. Um, we've added some detail. Let me see if I can make this a little smaller. Okay, so now we see this and we see our, our numbers. Okay, each part has its own number, figure number, it's figure two. So this is the same one that we saw printed on the front cover. This is showing that it's open. Uh, that's just the, the top that closes over. So it's a hinge closure. And again, this is what it is. So this is the feature that applicant was claiming to make it a drip resistant. And if any of you use coffee creamers, this is a feature that keeps it from dripping down the side of the, of the closure once you tilt it upright. Once you poured out your creamer, you tilt it upright, this is supposed to keep it from dripping down the side. All right, so here's some of the things that we talked about before. Um, here's the title of the invention again. There were no references to other applications. We talked about cross references, there was none. 
There was no statement of federally sponsored research and no appendix, uh, microfiche appendix. So again, they just have it there. We start with the background the, of the invention, talked about the technical problems that were posed. Here's the brief description of the drawings. Okay, so we have figure one, tells you it's a fragment, fragmentary isometric view of the package. Figure two, the fragmentary isometric package, but with the lid in its open position. Each one tells you a little bit about it. So then we have the description of the preferred embodiment. And then you see that each piece is listed here. So we have a closure system, um, a container. So each one has its own number, each part. Goes through all of that. And then we get to the claims. So when it's printed, it looks different than what we ask for it in the application. So here we have what is claimed and this is a dispenser closure for a container that has an opening to the container interior where a fluent substance may be stored, said dispenser closure comprising. So he has an open term so that he can then add other details in the independent, in the dependent claims, okay? In claim one, there was nothing mentioned about a hinge. But in claim four, we said the lid was attached to the body by a hinge. Okay, so I just wanted you to see what the um, what a patent would look like if you had never seen one before. And you can always find um, you can find patents on using Google search or using our um, search tool. Hopefully that was beneficial. If there are any questions, Albert, I appreciate your being here to help out with the chat. Are there any other questions that either of us could answer? I will we're happy to do so. Uh, I have a question, and I think it's yeah. it's implied by one of the uh, one of the notes in the chat from uh, one of our participants mm -hmm. about where to go for for more information. Uh, one uh, one of the participants notes uh, a forum, patentsview.org. Uh, and conversation amongst patent applic applicants, I believe. Uh, I also dropped into the chat the USPTO's Inventor Assistance Center. Uh, mm -hmm. Could you comment on pros and cons of a, a U or highlight further okay. assistance from USPTO? Okay, great. So with the Assistance Center, the Assistance Center, if you have a specific question about patent applications, or about a specific patent application, then you can call the Assistance Center and they, they're more than happy to help you. Um, we have several help desks that are available to assist applicants. We do have the Pro Se Assistance Center, as I mentioned before, where you can get help on your one-to-one uh, -one assistance from the Pro Se Assistance Center. Um, if you want to get information about other types of applications, um, you can either call those directly or they can direct you to those uh, other um, call centers. For instance, if someone decides they want to file internationally, then we have a PCT help desk that will help you with the internationally filed applications. So the Pro Se Assistance Center and the Applicants Assistance Center are both uh, great resources to help you. If you're not sure of how to start a search based on your invention, then I would call locate one of the PTRCs. The libraries are located in either our colleges or they might be a public library. We have those all across the country and they can help you to get started in your patent search. So those are great resources as well. Um, I don't know much about the um, this forum. I've not looked at that or at anything, so I can't really speak to that patents view uh, or forum. Um, that's not part of the USPTO. Um, I will tell you that there are um, independent inventor groups around the country. And there's, that could be a good resource for people to talk to other inventors. Uh, if you join one of those groups, um, they're always willing to help each other. We've had lots of conversations with different inventors that are part of these groups. And they talked about the, the wealth of knowledge that they received. Um, some of them didn't find out about the inventors groups until after they had gone through the patent process but they then found that they were able to get references for attorneys or agents, um, find information about how to go about getting um, funding 
by using the inventor groups as well. So, uh, I also wanted to highlight that the SPDC has just posted a, a poll here on screen. Hopefully, that shows up as a pop up yes. or other uh, notification for our attendees today, please give us your, your uh, feedback in this mm -hmm. survey. Uh, I want to hear about how helpful this was to you. Uh, also, what other topics, what other training uh, um, programs uh, can the SBDC deliver for you? So please give us that feedback. Uh, I have a few people who have already completed that, but if you didn't yet see that post-event survey, uh, pop up on, in your uh, in your webinar, uh, and it might be a separate window than this Zoom. Um, look for that. Please give us your feedback in our in that poll. And I will say, if anyone has any further questions that may come up later that we could answer, um, when we send out the slide deck, it will have a, an email address that you'll be able to send us an email, and we'll be able to get back with you. One, one thing that I also wanted to offer, and this is from the SBDC's experience in serving inventors as they, mm -hmm. they transition from being an inventor and having something potentially of value to customers to being small business owners, uh, bringing that product or that, that technology to the marketplace. Uh, one thing to be wary of is uh, for-profit inventor assistance uh, firms, uh, invention promotion firms. Um, if you have encounters and tele late night television or or internet uh, ads targeting inventors that that say we can help you make a whole lot of money with your patent, uh, be wary. Uh, read the fine print or ask the SBDC for advice about the resources that you're, you're considering engaging. Uh, recall at the beginning of today's session, I noted how the SBDC services are provided to you at no charge. Um, if you are encountering, if you're considering engaging a for-profit firm uh, that's offering to help you get your patent or to promote your patent, be aware of the fees that may be involved and also ask them about their track record. You have the right to ask that firm what percentage of um, clients that they have served have actually um, made a profit after being, um, after being assisted by them. So be wary of patent related scams that are not related to the USPTO. Mm -hmm. Great, great, great to bring that up, Stephen. Thank you, I appreciate that. That is very important. And the other, that brings up another point that is not part of this presentation that we probably should consider putting in here is about public disclosure. Mm -hmm. You don't want to publicly disclose your invention <clears throat> prior to, <clears throat> excuse me, prior to filing your patent application. <clears throat> So that doesn't mean you can't talk to an attorney or agent or talk to the SBDC about something because there's confidentiality there, but you don't want to publicly disclose your invention out in a public forum where people can hear it and see it because that has implications on, on your protection. So be, you know, be aware of public disclosure. Keep, keep it close to the vest, as my mother would say, until you're ready to file your patent application. <clears throat> Uh, Albert, I have you had a chance to see a question in the chat here about um, customs and borders? Uh, one of our attendees had a further question about that. Do you think we addressed that? Um, let's see. Um, I think Robin has uh, addressed the, that question already. Um, I would add. I would add one other thing that. Um, if you're wondering how to begin, writing a patent application is, uh, is not the easiest thing to do, but um, take advantage of filing that provisional application. The provisional is an informal, so all these big rules and regulations are not required, uh, and the fees are very, are very, very low. Uh, you can write it yourself, essentially include all the details of your invention and be as thorough as possible. And what that um, provisional does is it, um, it holds your place in line. It gives you one year to think about 
uh, you know, to talk to a patent attorney to file that formal non-provisional application. So it, it gives you a place in line while you're still thinking about it at very low co cost and you could do it, you could easily do it yourself. Uh, just make sure that when you file your application, include uh, all the details because with any application, once you file it, it you can't add to it and you can't change it. Oh, Hi, this is Prayas. I have a question. Um, is it if you put a provisional pattern and whatever is disclosed in that, and for instance, it takes longer than one year to file the regular utility pattern, would that be considered that the information was already disclosed and that is why it cannot be patented? Right. You have 12 months in order to claim priority to that application, you must file your non provisional within 12 months of that application. Um, I would like to so, add yeah. that, mm -hmm. that the provisional is kept secret. So it is not considered a disclosure. No one will see it. Except maybe the examiner looking for, to make sure you have <laughs> looking for it, that's, that's examining the application, the, the non-provisional. So right, there's John, something John Bird wrote in the chat. So any public disclosure disclosure would not serve as proof of the originator no. of the idea in court. Well, what happens is, and so U.S. laws are different than in other countries, right? So in the U.S., there's certain public disclosure that um, will prohibit you from protection, just as it is in other countries as well. So let's say in the U.S. we have something called a statutory bar, meaning that if you file an application within um, within 12 months, that application won't be used against you, right? But in other countries, there is no such thing as a statutory bar. If you file an application one day prior to your other application, the application can be used as prior art against your application. So there's no statutory bar um, in other countries. So with public disclosure, um, there are certain part, certain countries where if you publicly disclose your invention, that means that it's out for anyone to use. You, you no longer can claim protection that that's your invention that you can then get a patent for that. So that's why I'm, we're saying don't publicly disclose your invention. It's not used as um, originator of your, of your idea, no. Do not publicly disclose your invention unless they're implying the only agency to accept the patent is the custom board of um, So the patent protection, you either need a patent, so, you, so there's several types of intellectual property. There's patent, trademark, copyright, and trade secrets. Um, if you register your, IP with Customs and Border Control uh, Patrol, then they will stop or attempt to stop any illegally counterfeited goods from coming into the country based on your IP. And it's only Customs and Border Patrol that do that. The USPTO, we don't. Um, the only thing we do is to either grant your patent or grant your trademark. We don't deal with um, protection in terms of um, the law of whether or not you want to sue somebody or anything like that. We don't get into that litigation. That's not written as part of our, our stat of the, the goal of the PTO. As you know, the, the, the uh, intellectual property is protected in the US Constitution. And that's not part of of what we do is, is litigation or protecting your, your brands or your invention. Okay. I believe there's a further comment for... in the, oh. Okay. There we go. Additional okay. comment showed up in the chat. Okay, great, good. Glad I answered that for you. All right. And again, we'll get the uh, slides out to everyone.
Um, or if you if you like for us to send them out, we can. If you like, Shell, if you want us to send them to you and you send it out, that's fine. We'll get those to you later today or tomorrow morning. Um, and then you can send them to everyone who registered. Yes, just send them to and, me and then everyone, okay. um, they can go th sign, uh, sign into the SPDCE Center the same way they signed up. They log in and they can download them for themselves. Okay. 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 Sounds great. Thank you. All right. Well, Robin, thank you very much for your presentation. Thanks for joining us as well. Thank you for returning uh, to join us uh, at Bucknell's SBDC. Uh, and to everyone here, uh, know that you can readily follow up with the SBDC. Any of those emails that we sent you as you uh, registered and as you got a reminder about today's event, reply to any of those or uh, hit us at uh, sbdc at bucknell.edu. Um, and if you're not right nearby us again in central Pennsylvania, we'll help you connect with another SBDC uh, near you that can help you with uh, all manner of topics in your uh, in growing, uh, in starting or growing your small business. Thanks for joining us today.